Wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Bialik, and I am a criminal justice manager at Arnold Ventures. And I couldn't be more pleased that you have all taken the time to join today's panel. Uh, before kind of jumping into the day's presentation, I wanted to give just a little bit of background both on uh, our interest in the, the study that's being presented today, talk about the timeliness of the moment, walk us through the agenda, and then introduce my uh, wonderful panelists. Um, so just a little bit of background, Arnold Ventures is a national philanthropy with offices in Houston, New York, and Washington, D.C., and we work on issues related to criminal justice reform, public finance, health care, among others. And one focus of the philanthropy's work over the last year has really been on rethinking crisis response. So how do we better respond to individuals who are experiencing mental health issues, substance use issues, who are experiencing homelessness and cycling into crisis? Um, what, you know, what options, what responses do, do communities have? We know that homelessness and untreated behavioral health conditions are at the root of many crisis-related calls for service and that these issues have led to a disproportionate representation of vulnerable populations in the justice system and has overburdened the emergency response system in the United States. Our interest in this work is that we were seeing a ton of innovation happening across the country in communities that were piloting and testing new responses. And while programs like LEAD and CIT training for police officers were at the top of our radar, and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with as well, we knew there were many variations of these responses in existence, and we wanted to more fully understand what these looked like. We wanted to dig into outreach programs and 911 programs and those led by law enforcement and other first responders like fire and EMS. And we wanted to understand their prevalence, the evidence that existed behind them, and most importantly, how key decision makers were deciding which responses to implement given available funding, local partnerships, and capacities. Now, 18 months later, we are at this critical moment. This really, this issue couldn't be more timely as communities nationwide are grappling with new ways to respond to those in crisis to prove, improve outcomes for both individuals and communities. And building on the more than 30 programs that are featured in the app's guidebook, which we'll be talking about today, cities are making news daily as local officials are taking bold moves to shift responses to crisis calls. The San Francisco mayor announced that the city's police department will no longer respond to non-criminal 911 calls and requests for service. Instead, trained, unarmed service workers will respond to calls that do not involve violence, including mediating disputes between neighbors and handling issues involving homelessness and school discipline. The city of Albuquerque created Albuquerque Community Safety, a first-of-its-kind cabinet-level department that is being designed as an alternative to police response for 911 calls. In St. Petersburg, Florida, city officials announced plans to fund a community assistance liaison program, which will employ social workers to respond to nonviolent 911 calls related to issues of mental health crises, homelessness, and drug use. And in Denver, Colorado, a long planned program was announced this summer to remove police to some 911 calls responding to mental health clinicians instead to certain behavioral health calls. So I really just wanted to say that I couldn't be more excited for today's panel where our partners at Apt Associates will share the framework that they have developed to help guide local policy and practice. And I'm pleased that our panelists from the National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, and the National Conference for State Legislators were able to join us to contextualize findings and discuss implications for key policymakers at all levels of government. So a quick overview of today's agenda. We're going to start with a welcome and introductions of each of the panelists. We'll follow that with a brief presentation of the app study and then open up for a moderated discussion from our panelists to talk about how they think these findings are really uh, applied across the key decision makers that they work with daily. And then finally, we'll open up to questions uh, from all of you. So at any point, please feel free to drop a question in the chat and we'll make sure to get to that at the very end of the call. So with that, I would like to introduce our 
panelists for today. Uh, we have Holly Swan and Meg Chapman from Apt Associates. Holly Swan is a sociologist and implementation scientist with expertise in criminal justice, behavioral health, and health services research and evaluation. She is the technical lead for Apt Study to develop a framework for understanding and evaluating the range of crisis response programs that have been implemented by first responder agencies in the U.S. Meg Chapman is a principal associate at APT and a P, uh, PD of the APT study. We also have Amber Widry from the National Conference for State Legislatures. Amber is a program principal in the criminal justice program at NCSL. She specializes in issues relating to front end criminal justice policy, including law enforcement, pretrial release, deflection, diversion, treatment courts, and forensic mental health services. Amber also has expertise in issues related to drug crime, sex offender registries, and capital punishment. Her work at NCSL includes tracking and analyzing state legislation, providing research support to state legislatures, and testifying for legislative committees. Prior to joining NCSL, Amber worked as a student prosecutor and served as a fellow in both the Colorado General Assembly and the House of Commons in London. Charlotte Reesing from the National Association of Counties is our next panelist. Charlotte is NACO's Program Manager for Justice. She is responsible for assisting county officials across the country in her effort to improve local justice systems. Prior to joining NACO, Charlotte served as policy analyst with the American Civil Liberties Union. She also interned at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Charlotte holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Tulane University and a JD from the UDC David A. Clark School of Law. We also have Sue Polis from the National League of Cities. Sue is responsible for directing the health and wellness portfolio for NLC as part of the Institute for Youth Education and Families. The portfolio includes the conceptualization, development, and implementation of Cities of Opportunity, a multi-year effort to engage mayors and city leaders in comprehensively addressing social determinants of health. Additional focus areas include housing and homelessness, mental health, and substance use. Prior to the National League of Cities, Ms. Polis led the development and management of the Trust for America Health, external relations and strategic partnership efforts in support of the organization's public policy goals with a focus on substance use disorders and employer role in community health improvement. She currently serves on advisory boards for the Center to Advance Community Health and Equity, Voices for Healthy Kids, and New York University's Small and Mid-Sized City Typology Project. So with that, I am excited to go ahead and start the day's presentation by handing things over to Holly Swan, who will provide an overview of the study and some of the key findings. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for attending today. Really excited to have you all here with us and excited to be on this panel with such great co-panelists, so really looking forward to our discussion. Um, so just to get started, as Katie mentioned, you know, there's a lot of various programs going on. There have been for a while, and increasingly, you know, places are trying more and more programs, developing new things. Um, so what we wanted to do was really to see what, what sense can we make of all that? What are, what are the sort of commonalities between these different programs? What's similar? What's different? What are the different contexts within which people are making decisions around what programs to implement or what, what types of things to try in their communities. Um, and so this guidebook that we developed as part of this study, along with some additional um, resources for the, the field, um, was really to provide a decision-making framework in order to improve response to individuals experiencing crisis. And as Katie mentioned at the beginning, our focus really was on substance use, mental health, and homelessness-related challenges. Um, we also focused um, exclusively on programs that were led and designed for uh, first responders. So there's a whole host of other programs that work in this space and deal with this issue, but we were really interested in the ones that focus on first responders. Um, and so by, really our intention is that by, by organizing programs into types, we're hoping that that can help agencies use the framework as a starting point to either determine what program they may want to adopt or whether they want to develop their own program using the components that we outline um, through our synthesis of, of these various programs. So really it's meant to be a starting point. Um, it's not a how-to guide. It's not a compendium of programs. It's really an overarching framework to try to serve as a starting point for decision making. 
And what we did um, to accomplish this, we did a systematic uh, review of the range of approaches that have been implemented. Um, and we went back, I think, 15 years, um, and again, focused on first responder agencies and programs that they were doing and in the United States. And then we really just organized, as I mentioned, the specific programs. For example, you've probably heard a lot about the CAHOOTS program lately. Katie mentioned CIT and LEAD, some other you know, programs that are out there by name. Um, but we wanted to organize these based on their common features. Who's the agency that's doing the responding? What activities are involved in the response? And what are the outcomes that these programs are trying to achieve? And so what we found, as Katie mentioned, there were actually 54 programs that we identified that had enough um, sort of information published for us to be able to sort of make any sense of. Um, and these fell into three overarching program models or buckets, as we like to call them. Um, the first being outreach and prevention, which really is what it sounds like. So this is a little bit less of a response and more of sort of a focused intention of doing outreach to vulnerable populations and intervening before a crisis occurs or being able to intervene sort of on the spot when, an, when a crisis is encountered during an outreach effort or patrol, for example. Um, and these tended to focus primarily on homeless populations. but. As we know, there's a lot of comorbidities and co-occurring uh, issues that occur for homeless populations, so it really did kind of run the gamut. Uh, the second program model was intervention at the 911 call, and these are programs that focus on intervening and um, developing programming at the 911 call centers in order to sort of determine how responses are initiated. Um, and then the third being intervention by the first responder at the scene of a crisis, and these are sort of the classic uh, programs that you are probably familiar with, things like CIT, um, fell into this program model. Um, so again, each of these program models has sort of common goals um, and things that they're trying to achieve um, or a particular area of focus, and they generally um, have a similar response um, and sort of flow in how they, they operate. Um, but there are some differences of within each of these program models and some nuance, which is sort of the crux of our framework, and I'll dive into that next. So looking first at outreach and prevention, um, we have three, we actually found four um, types of programs that fall within outreach and prevention. The three here were sort of the most similar. Um, so starting at the left with the specialized outreach, this is kind of exactly how it sounds, where basically you have a specialized responder or a unit of responders who's trained in a specialized area of expertise, typically crisis intervention. Um, and so this specialized unit goes out and conducts outreach, typically in homeless um, populations and homelessness uh, communities with high populations of homelessness. Um, and they you know, conduct needs assessments and then make connections to needed services. In the paired outreach example, the middle column there, Essentially, you have a first responder going out and doing outreach, but they are paired with one other person, typically a clinician or a social worker. And what this brings to the response is the ability to intervene with on-site, real-time clinical intervention if a crisis is encountered. Um, and so as opposed to, you know, just having a, the ability to sort of de-escalate, they're able to actually provide, you know, brief treatment um, on the scene. And then all the way on the right, the team-based outreach follows a similar logic as the paired lot, um, outreach, but these are multidisciplinary teams of responders who go out together um, and can always provide anything that's sort of needed um, on the spot. Uh, the fourth type of program within outreach and prevention that's actually not on the slide, but because um, it's sort of qualitatively different from these three is what we call voluntary walk-in programs. And these are essentially um, the sort of safe station model, if you're familiar with that, where essentially if somebody has, for example, a substance use disorder and wants to present themselves to a fire department or a police station and they have paraphernalia or drugs on them, they're allowed to turn those in and instead of getting, you know, press, having charges pressed against them, then they can instead get linked into treatment. Um, and so it's a way to sort of divert people away from the criminal justice system. Um, but, and, it, and it's sort of before a crisis, preventing a crisis. Um, and so that's why we put it into this model. Um, intervention at the 911 call follows a similar pattern. So basically on the left, the specialized dispatch, rather than it being a um, firefighter or a police officer that sort of gets a specialized training, it's actually the 911 dispatcher, the person who receives the call gets a, a training, typically crisis intervention, um, and de-escalates the, um, situation and then determines the appropriate response. An embedded dispatch, 
rather than training the actual call taker. The call taker sits next to or in the call center there is a person who is a clinician and so is a behavioral, has behavioral health training that then when the um, dispatcher receives a behavioral health related call, they just transfer it over to that clinician who then handles the process. Um, and then the third, um, all the way on the right, is the transfer to crisis center program type where essentially a call taker will, instead of handling the call themselves, they'll recognize it as a behavioral health crisis and transfer it out to a crisis center or a crisis line in the community. This, of course, requires that such a line or a center exists um, within the community. And then the third model, the intervention by first responder. Again, this is sort of the sort of classic understanding of crisis response and, and diversion um, uh, approaches to diversion. Specialized response is sort of the CIT sort of model where um, basically you have a first responder who is trained in a specialized skill set and they are the ones who get dispatched when a, a call is received where there's a behavioral health concern. Um, an embedded co-response similar to outreach rather than um, training the first responder in that skill set even though you might still train the, the first responder in it, they're dispatched along with a clinician or social worker to provide some additional services either through case management and connection to resources or clinical intervention. Um, and these clinicians and social workers are actually embedded in the um, department and dispatched, you know, along with the first responder. And then finally in the mobile and virtual co-response, this is sort of the CAHOOTS model. Um, this is an example where the first responder gets dispatched and either a mobile crisis team, for example, gets called to the scene as well, or once the first responder is at the scene and identifies the need, they can call the mobile response team then um, to the scene as well. Um, so it's sort of important to note about this program type, um, those mobile crisis teams could be doing a lot of that sort of outreach and prevention, but those, they're not necessarily involved with first responders all the time. Katie mentioned the example of San Francisco, where they're sort of doing this kind of approach, um, trying this out. But so for our framework, we really wanted it to be sort of as a co-response with the first responder um, were the programs that we were focused on. Um, and then the slash virtual response, um, this is, for example, to if a first responder is on the scene and there's a behavioral health crisis, they're able to um, use a tablet or some other technology to do teleservices with a clinician offsite. Um, also, as Katie mentioned at the beginning, in addition to just sort of understanding, you know, what are the different programs out there and how are they similar and different, we also wanted to just get a sense of what was the evidence for these program models. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of research, um, which might not be surprising to a lot of people on this call. Um, the bulk of the research is around sort of CIT, which is not surprising because I think it's been around, you know, probably the longest of all these programs. So there's just been more time to sort of develop more literature around that program. Um, and of the 54 programs that we identified, only four had um, a published quasi-experimental evaluation for them, and they're listed here. And you can see they are all in different program types. So um, there's not a lot of evidence for any one particular program type over another. Um, and so much more research and evaluation is needed in this space in order to sort of understand sort of what is, what is the ideal combination of factors, what is the, pro, you know, what program is most effective in what context. Um, and so when thinking about whether to, um, you know, adopt a program or start a new program, it's really important to think about both the gaps in the evidence, but then also what are the thing, what are the areas where I can be sort of assessing what I'm doing as well. Um, and so drawing from the evidence, but then also <laughs> recognizing where there is a lack of evidence. Um, and so a really useful tool for assessing what you're doing is logic modeling. Um, this is a technique used in evaluation. Essentially, it just sort of outlines um, the, the, the theory of change, how your program should be achieving the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so really a, an essential starting point for figuring out, you know, how to reimagine crisis response is figuring out what am I trying to achieve? Um, and then kind of working backwards from there to how am I going to achieve that? What do I need to have in place in order to get a program um, operating? Um, 
this is also important to do regardless of the level of evidence that exists. So, for example, if we saw some evaluations of LEAD and other programs, just because those have some evidence in one location doesn't mean that will directly transfer to your location. For example, what works in San Francisco might not work in Kansas City. So, it's important to still be monitoring, um, you know, what you're, what you're doing. So there's a whole range of evaluation methodologies available, um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple here, process and impact evaluations. Impact, of course, being is what I'm doing, achieving what I'm trying to, trying to achieve. But process evaluations are important as well for understanding how is this program actually operating and where, you know, I, I think that it's doing this to do that, but maybe there's this gap um, in, in how it's actually being operationalized that is skewing my results in some way. Um, rapid cycle evaluation is another technique and strategy that I think is increasingly important. As Katie mentioned, this is a really hot topic right now. There's a lot of agencies and localities that are trying trying things and want to get things going um, in response to the pressures. Um, and so rapid cycle evaluation is a technique that um, lends itself to that kind of case. Um, you can try something, test it out, make adaptations, and continue to cycle through um, as you go. So this is a really um, useful tool for um, the current situation, I would argue. Um, and then related to that, dissemination and shared learning, it's really important to get lessons learned out there. Um, we did, I mentioned there were only four sort of quasi-experimental evaluations of these programs, but there was a lot of descriptive um, studies out there that sort of had, uh, you know, counts of interactions and things like that, which are also really useful to know. Um, and shared learning, you know, call if you're interested in, if you think you might be interested in something like the LEAD program, call them up and say, you know, how did you do this? What kind of things did you have to think about? So on and so forth. Um, which leads me to my last point, which in our guidebook, we go into each of these in, in a lot of detail, but just wanted to highlight them here. Um, points of consideration for either adopting a program or starting a new one. As I mentioned, your first question is just, what am I trying to address? What is it that I'm trying to achieve and accomplish and work backwards from there? So if I know that I'm trying to address the problem of substance use disorder in my community, what agencies need to be involved in that response? Do I need to have, you know, my fire department involved and, um, you know, police or is it just fire? Um, what kind of partnerships and coordination are required if I'm going to embed a clinician in my call center? Um, or if I want to have a mobile crisis team co-respond with me, what does that look like? Um, local laws and policies, for example, do you have a good Samaritan law in place that could make something like a safe, safe, safe station a little bit more feasible? Or do you have laws saying anytime you directly transport somebody to treatment, you have to have a police officer present? Um, that could have implications for the kind of programming that you do. Um, relatedly, sources of payment and reimbursement. If you want to do a virtual co-response, you might have to think about getting reimbursed for teleservices. What does that look like? Um, relatedly required technology, do you have the actual tablets to do that kind of a co-response? What would it cost to do that? Where would you get them? Um, what other resources do you need? Do you have desk space for a clinician to sit at your precinct? Um, and then the scale of the program, talked a little bit about this, but um, you know, are you interested in a program that operates from nine to five, or do you want one just in the evening? Um, is this something that should be 24 seven? And then, you know, similarly, is it something that we just want in this city or should we expand it to be the whole county or the state? Unfortunately, we have a lot of good co-panelists can, that can speak to all of those levels. Um, and then, you know, is it just focusing on substance use or do we want to tackle, you know, all of the co-occurring issues that come along with that? And then finally, training, um, both training specific to the type of responder who's going to be involved, but then also for the type of crisis because there are differences in how um, the response will look depending on what you're trying to respond to. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Katie to go ahead and moderate our discussion. Wonderful, thanks so much, Holly. Um, and for all of our uh, attendees, please feel free to continue to drop questions into the chat and we will get to those questions uh, at, the, at the end of the presentations from our other panelists. So next I'm gonna ask Amber uh, from the National Conference for State Legislators to just talk a little bit more about, you know, the report, these findings and to contextualize, you know, what this means for lawmakers as they 
head into the 2021 session. Thanks so much, Katie, and also thanks, Holly. Um, I really appreciate this report. It's a tremendous research for the field, and uh, I especially appreciate the framework that it provides because it answers a lot of the questions that I get from lawmakers uh, on this subject. So as Katie mentioned, today I'm going to talk briefly about the role of state lawmakers in improving crisis response systems across the country. Uh, but first, I want to take just a moment to thank Katie and Arnold Ventures for their support of NCSL and our continued work to provide resources and education uh, for our members in the field on this and a number of related topics. Uh, for those who may not know, NCSL is a bipartisan organization, and among our membership is all 7,383 state lawmakers and more than 30,000 legislative staff across the 50 states. At NCSL, my focus is tracking legislation related to crisis response systems, and I can certainly say that this has been an area of interest for lawmakers as of late. Lawmakers can have a few roles uh, that help support programs like those described by this new report, uh, but I want to focus on four of those roles today and the various impacts that they can have on the field. The first role is for lawmakers to sponsor authorizing legislation for specific kinds of program models uh, and rolling those out on a statewide basis. This kind of legislation can have a number of impacts. It can require creation of a program at a local level. It can authorize the creation of programs at a local level, meaning that local officials can choose to opt in to participation. It can codify best practices if they exist for a particular model. And legislation can also provide legal protections or authorization uh, for certain actions. Some of these Holly mentioned at the end of her presentation, such as authorizing transport for individuals to alternative locations. Um, which can help really break down some of the barriers that cities and counties face when starting up a new program. Authorizing legislation can also help raise awareness for various program models across the state and encourage development and expansion of programs uh, at the community level. Kentucky Senate Bill 120 in 2017 was one of the first examples we saw of authorizing legislation uh, for one of the program models mentioned in the report. The bill authorized local law enforcement agencies to establish ANGEL initiative programs, uh, which is a self-referral model, um, and the legislation also provided for immunity, destruction of surrendered items, and connections to treatment. Uh, the program is now available statewide through Kentucky State Police. Um, another notable example, I think somebody actually dropped in the chat the uh, task resource, um, which mentions the five pathways. Illinois had recent legislation that authorized the five pathways at the state level. It's the first state to have done that and so far the only state. The second role that lawmakers can really have is legislation can also authorize and fund pilot programs to test and study uh, new innovative programs or models. Pilot programs can be a great way to test new models or introduce a model to a community with support from the state. Uh, to give an example of this, Colorado has used pilot programs paired with state funding to start and expand the use of both law enforcement assisted diversion and co-responder models across the state. Senate Bill 207 in 2017 provided funding for co-responder models, uh, starting with just five to eight jurisdictions as pilot programs. And then funding in subsequent years has expanded the programs, and funding is now available in 23 counties with coverage for more than 50 communities. So that initial pilot program really sort of um, sparked the initial models in Colorado, and those jurisdictions are now able to learn from one another in the network that's facilitated by the state. The specifics of implementation, I will say, for the co-responder programs in Colorado varies across communities. Um, all of the programs for co-responder models have the same basic elements, but there are really a number of approaches that have been taken to meet the needs uh, of local communities in the most efficient way based on the local resources that are available. Colorado has also funded four law enforcement assisted diversion programs that was um, authorized by legislation and then funding started in 2018. A key component to this and many other pilot programs is data collection and study of the effectiveness of this model. And again, this is something that Holly got into, um, but it's also another way that state lawmakers and legislation can support uh, this policy area. So the lead pilot in Colorado included funding for the programs themselves in four jurisdictions, but also provided support for rigorous program evaluation of effectiveness across all four sites to be completed by the University of Colorado Denver. 
And data and analysis of effectiveness are essential and should be incorporated into any new programming. Um, and this is something that the states can and have assisted with even when the programs aren't necessarily developed and deployed at the state level. Uh, an example of this is New Mexico, which appropriated funds in 2017 to cover the cost of evaluations for Santa Fe's local LEAD program uh, that at the time was being conducted by the University of New Mexico. LEAD is one of the few programs that you've uh, heard about that has a significant amount or at least some amount of evaluation done at this point. Um, and a lot of that has really been supported by state legislation and appropriations and action across the states. The third way that lawmakers uh, can play a role is that state funding and grant support can also benefit services in local communities that are utilized by or serve as critical components of crisis response program models. States can have an impact on local programs and crisis services by supporting regional and statewide infrastructure and services. An example of this is the 2017 Arkansas legislation that was enacted that established procedures for and funding for the operation of four regional crisis intervention units. The first unit opened in early 2018, and all four now serve as resources for surrounding communities. The crisis intervention units coordinate closely with local law enforcement and, in particular, law enforcement crisis intervention teams uh, for referrals and admissions for individuals in lieu of booking into jails. More recently this year, uh, Utah had really notable legislation that appropriated state grant dollars for the development of a behavioral health receiving center in the state and also to provide crisis services. In the same bill, the state appropriated $2.4 million to expand their statewide mobile crisis outreach teams, and another $275,000 for something that seems really basic but can be really important, which is the replacement, maintenance, and purchase of new vehicles for the mobile crisis outreach teams in the state. Other funding was also really, really critical and supported the operation of the statewide a uh, crisis line and warm line and the development of a crisis intervention application to be used by first responders and emergency medical personnel. And then the fourth piece I want to talk about as far as state lawmakers' involvement in this area today um, really reflects their role as conveners in their districts and their local communities. There isn't always going to be a statewide solution uh, for some of these issues. And so in addition to assisting with legislation and funding and resources at the state level to provide infrastructure, um, lawmakers can also really serve as conveners in their own districts and bring together stakeholders and identify community resources and facilitate working towards finding solutions that work at the individual community level. Uh, an example of this is the city and county of Denver recently launched a new STAR program that's modeled after the CAHOOTS program that you've heard a little bit about in Oregon. Um, and that program was initially brought to Denver by Colorado State Representative Leslie Harrod and some of her colleagues who traveled to Eugene uh, did some ride-alongs with staff um, from CAHOOTS last year and then um, really connected staff in Colorado and Oregon and launched that program in Denver. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, in the role that we traditionally think about lawmakers having an impact. Sometimes it can be their role as community leaders where um, they have the most impact and can be really important. And then finally, I just wanted to briefly note that NCSL's new law enforcement legislation database on our website is tracking some really innovative and new uh, proposals that we're seeing in legislation uh, to create alternative or entirely non-law enforcement responses uh, for these types of instances. And so um, we'll be continuing that work into 2021 with the support of AB. And uh, it's sort of an idea generation point right now. And you can see some of the interesting and innovative new things that states are looking at. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Katie to talk a little bit more um, about the local level. Thanks so much, Amber. And thanks for sharing all of the ways in which state lawmakers can support both the piloting um, and, and scaling of some of these, these different programs and importantly, the evaluation of their efficacy. So our next panelist is uh, Charlotte Reesing from the National Association of Counties. And she's gonna speak a little bit more about, you know, what factors are most important for county level uh, policymakers when working to improve crisis response to vulnerable populations. So Charlotte, I will hand things over to you. 
Thanks, Katie. And thank you, Holly and ABT for holding this webinar on such an important topic and for producing such a wonderful resource here. So uh, I work for the National Association of Counties, which is a membership organization of counties around the country. And I work primarily on an initiative called the Data Driven Justice Initiative, which brings together communities to disrupt the cycle of incarceration and crisis. So communities that participate the meetings initiative develop strategies to promote better outcomes for frequent utilizers by uh, integrating data from justice, health, and human services around the county uh, or city in some cases. So really, the county role in funding and supporting crisis response um, ha is very multifaceted, and one of the primary uh, role is, is really funding. So, so counties, uh, they fund $93 billion total in justice and public safety services in, in total, including 911 call centers. Uh, they also, in some cases, uh, fully fund jails. Uh, they counties control about 91% of all local jails, and jails do drug misuse and mental health screenings to identify who is in crisis, as well as uh, as connecting those folks with. Uh, diversion, alternatives to incarceration, and services upon release um, for, for the people that are entering jail who might use those services. Uh, counties also run police departments in uh, a lot of rural counties. Uh, and so, well, in an urban center, you might have uh, you might have a city running a police department or have it under different entities. In some rural counties, uh, we see. Uh, we see counties kind of running the whole the whole show. So they they are in charge of police departments, who obviously uh, are a lot of the first responders that respond to uh, crisis events. So counties also fund Medicaid. Uh, they contribute around twenty billion dollars to the non-federal share of Medicaid. They also run hospitals, spend around eighty three billion dollars in community health and hospitals. And they also fund behavioral health in, in most places, annually investing around uh, $70 billion. And these are all obviously very important factors in crisis response. Uh, so actually properly funding um, Medicaid and uh, hospitals and community health services are, are pretty vital in uh, responding to a crisis and to frequent utilizers of, of, of both health and justice systems. So another way in which counties, um, in terms of funding specifically, uh, really play a role here is in IT departments. So county IT departments uh, are, are sort of a central, um, a central gauge of, of data in the county, and they can really be the center office to uh, integrate data and identify who uh, and what needs support in crisis response, whether that be particular people, particular frequent utilizers, or, uh, you know, what services need more funding, uh, where are gaps in services, where are people falling through the cracks. Um, and that's really where DDJ steps in, the data-driven justice. So IT departments in counties or, um, or elsewhere uh, can really sort of be this, this main uh, frame uh, combining and integrating um, the data from all of these different entities and um, service providers and first responders in um, and really identifying how to help people and how to get them out out of these cycles. Um, so I think some of the biggest challenges with crisis responsibility in these rural counties that uh, um, that may be running their own uh, jails and police departments and all of these other things, is that they don't have staffing for behavioral health or they don't have crisis staffing. They don't have a single person who does either of these things. Um, and I think um, some of the, the biggest and easiest ways to get crisis responses that is effective in these places is to just provide even one staff person or at least some training to existing staff in crisis response and in diversion. Um, another, uh, and this is really like the main funding piece, um, but an ongoing funding piece for counties 
is really relocation of funds. So counties run budget and uh, based on where data shows that uh, money can most help uh, frequent utilizers, but also people in crisis, uh, counties are responsible ultimately for reallocating where those funds can go. They can fund crisis centers. They can fund services for people in crisis. They can fund behavioral health services. Uh, and I think that's one of one of really our most important role as counties in budgeting is big budgeting. So um, another way in which counties are really uh, uh, active in this process is identifying agencies and actors that should be in communication about crisis response. So um, because counties have this role in funding all of these different types of services and um, and response, uh, they can be, it can be one of the best levels to really identify who's working on these things, who would be a good person to have a seat at the table, and, um, and really be able to um, tell the people in charge, I guess, really where money should go and how these things should function and how things are actually working out on the community level. Uh, and a lot of our counties not only help identify these actors and agencies, but also coordinate um, agencies and actors in crisis response. They form task, task forces, they form committees where they bring together people from all of these different agencies, uh, first responders, healthcare providers, uh, crisis providers, staff from the local jail, maybe even police or frequently police rather, uh, to um, coordinate their responses to people in crisis. So I think a, a challenge that people tend to have when trying to institute crisis response in counties is getting buy-in from county leadership. And I think one of the main, uh, the main ways to really get buy-in is to use data to tell your story. And that's hard if you don't have funding to collect data um, currently, but I think that can be one of the most compelling things to leadership in counties um, to really fund crisis response and actually um, and actually get involved. Uh, another thing you can do is bring in stories of individual impact. Um, how, how has crisis response particularly helped certain folks? How has it failed certain folks? Um, and you can bring in stories from other counties or other jurisdictions of, of uh, you know, where this has worked and, and where it really does divert people from the criminal system and ultimately save counties money as well as help people's lives and help them, um, you know, not get caught up in this cycle of incarceration and um, crisis. Uh, so another big way I think that really getting buy-in from county leadership um, can work is just intensive education. And that involves a lot of interfacing with your county of officials and leadership. Um, to really like listen to them, listen to their issues with, um, you know, current crisis response and respond to those with specific examples of data, um, with specific data driven apps also, um, presenting them with particular things that that have uh, specific data behind them, and um, you're asking for a particular reform, very specific reform, and encourage them to be really active and champions of this type of reform in their counties. There's a lot of tools and resources that you can also share with government officials and have them share with media and with the community at large to help create kind of a culture of buy-in around crisis response. So in our counties, um, we've seen this buy-in uh, work in a variety of ways. Uh, in Johnson County, Iowa, I think some of the biggest lessons learned there were um, were really to identify who the particular stakeholders that were most important to have buy-in from when trying to institute crisis or a better crisis response system. And then for those particular stakeholders, finding discrete problems that crisis intervention could solve or help. Uh, and that included, um, that actually involved going not just to the leaders of these, of these different agencies and organizations, 
but actually talking to some of the, the direct providers and seeing where they were having issues, where they were seeing problems and, and finding from there uh, where the real problems are, where the real pain points are, that crisis intervention and different crisis strategies can help. And they found that very persuasive and productive um, when trying to then persuade their nonprofits and police departments and other providers working together and um, actually providing uh, a better crisis intervention program. Uh, we also saw, uh, we've seen different things all over, um, but in, in Dane County, there's been a different type of buy-in process, and they really have full, a full uh, uh, buy-in, really, at this point. And they have just fully funded a behavioral health resource center, and the, the process of building that, that resource center uh, has really helped move everyone along. So, so in the process of talking about this health resource center made the county really realize how much they needed to put into uh, mental health and behavioral health, and that's actually helped them to get funding for a plan for a new mental health triage and restoration center on top of their behavioral health resource center. So I encourage you all to, to use your, your wins and your time um, planning your first step and your second steps and really looking ahead. And um, that's all I have. Um, thank you so much again for all of your time. And I'll send it back to Katie. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And so our last uh, panelist today, Sue Polis, uh, is from the National League of Cities. Is going to share a little bit more about the work that they've been doing with city leaders to improve crisis response to individuals with behavioral health and, and housing issues. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's, a, it's wonderful to be with you all today on this uh, important topic around reimagining response. And special thanks to Arnold Ventures for their support of NLC's work on this issue. Uh, the National League of Cities, our organization, is nearly 100 years old. Uh, we work to represent small, mid-sized, and large cities across the country, uh, regionally diverse, uh, diverse in many ways, and certainly working to represent uh, uh, cities in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, of course, NLC has worked in substance use and homelessness issues over the past several years, considering the opioid epidemic and housing crises uh, many cities uh, faced uh, prior uh, to COVID-19. And, and certainly, uh, city leaders are on the front lines uh, of these complex and challenging issues. Uh, and there are so many challenges in communities across the country right now, but in every challenge, also opportunities. And so today, I really want to share with you what we've learned uh, as we led a research project last year with Arnold Ventures to look more closely at the intersections between homelessness, mental health, and substance use as it relates to response and working to improve outcomes for uh, our most vulnerable in our communities. I also want to share how this work dovetails with current calls for police reform and how we see cities further adapting approaches uh, in light of COVID. So briefly to begin, last year uh, we partnered with the health policy team at the George Washington University to look at city approaches and emergency response and crisis stabilization, again, across homelessness, mental health, uh, and substance abuse. Our process included uh, a membership survey to NLC uh, cities across the country, an environmental scan, including stakeholder interviews with organizations like the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, the National Association of Counties, the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors, uh, SAMHSA, and the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. And finally, we also conducted a, a thorough literature review that led to the identification and ultimately the interviews we, co we conducted with 11 cities and counties. And as a result of all of this, we developed uh, initial findings through a series of three issue briefs, which I'll speak a little bit more about uh, in, in a little better detail. Nine city county case studies, which are available uh, uh, on our website. A Hill briefing uh, followed by a, count, a policy convening with eight federal agencies, culminating in an executive summary that we uh, released at the end of last year. 
So between the survey and literature review, uh, 90 cities slash counties were identified for possible inclusion in the study. And ultimately, we selected cities using a criteria across uh, geographic diversity, community size, and, and uh, mounting uh, at least uh, outcomes uh, in emergency response and crisis stabilization approaches. Although, as, as Holly pointed out, um, evaluation remains somewhat elusive uh, of these efforts. Our emphasis was on cities that had developed efforts that work across sectors. So aligned with the APT Associates framework that Holly presented a little earlier, more aligned with uh, the team-based model, if you will, uh, with hospitals, health systems, local service organizations, among others. We recognize that uh, many cities' efforts have been spurred by different needs, and, and Holly mentioned this in her considerations. In some cases, they grow out of efforts to address the opioid epidemic, in other instances, working to better manage growing homelessness populations, among other examples. Uh, we did two rounds of interviews with the following cities. Um, Fort Collins, Colorado, their mental health co-responder program. Huntington, West Virginia, and their quick response team. Indianapolis, Indiana, and their mobile crisis assistance team. Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, and their safe stations program. Philadelphia and the city-run managed care organization, Community Behavioral Health, Rapid City, South Dakota, and the Rapid City Police Department's Quality of Life Unit, San Antonio, Texas, and the San Antonio Police Department's Mental Health Detail, Wake County, North Carolina, and Wake County's Enhanced Mobile Crisis Pilot Program, Wichita, Kansas, and Wichita Police Department's Homelessness Outreach uh, Team. In many cases, the approaches uh, have been further expanded upon. For instance, in Indianapolis, uh, the MCAT model, they continue to build on this effort, including a new assessment and interve intervention center that will open uh, on December 1st. And as Katie mentioned in her opening remarks, a number of cities like Albuquerque are working to implement new divisions like community safety division on par with fire and police, but staff with civilians. So as part of our city interviews last year, we, t we sought to examine what and why approaches were developed, who was involved, how the efforts were financed, the use of data, and ultimately our real emphasis uh, was to better understand the barrier cities face in, in advancing these types of efforts in an effort to help them overcome and, and better spread and scale these models. Uh, so last summer, uh, through late fall, early winter, uh, in collaboration with Arnold Ventures, we released uh, a series of issue briefs. Um, the first brief uh, really focused on the problems, the scope of the problems, associated costs, poor outcomes, and we began to identify various approaches being used uh, by cities. The second brief details city approaches that work across systems. Uh, for a variety of models and efforts. And the third and final brief uh, leans in on the recommendations that we've made, the policy recommendations across federal, state, and local levels um, informed by the barriers we identified. Um, and finally, the executive summary we released in December of last year was informed by a Hill briefing uh, that we did in October, along with a policy convening uh, with eight different federal agencies city, county stakeholders, and a number of partners uh, to explore these barriers and identify recommendations. So what did we learn? Uh, mental illness, substance use disorder, and homelessness pose significant interconnected challenges for cities. Uh, Cross-system approaches show promise to produce better outcomes for vulnerable populations in response and stabilization efforts. Several cities across the country are using cross-system collaboration to expand services and supports. And we feel like these cities really serve as a model or exemplars for others uh, as they work toward develop, developing more effective emergency response and stabilization efforts to better support vulnerable individuals. And now we also recognize, of course, that police reform efforts hold progress for reimagining new approaches to community safety that better engage civilians such as social workers, behavioral health specialists, community health workers, among others. And with everything now happening, of course, between the COVID pandemic and calls for racial justice, where are the opportunities? Uh, one of our main recommendations last year called for a mindset shift at the local level uh, to a public health framework to better address the needs of vulnerable, vulnerable individuals. 
So in many ways, we see this time as a moment, right? Police reform efforts, broader calls for system reform, will promise to make progress uh, for new approaches to community safety. Uh, a recent public agenda poll uh, that was done at the end of June found that 57% of Americans support sending social workers and EMTs to respond to mental health, substance use, and domestic violence issues instead of police. 57% support, uh, support for social workers and counselors monitoring school safety instead of police. And 55% who support using technology instead of police to enforce traffic laws. So we feel like this is a time to catalyze further change. And while our research effort included policy recommendations across federal, state, and local governments, I just want to highlight a few more specific to local efforts given time constraints. So of course, financing, how do we pay for this? Oftentimes the funds cities have for these efforts come through narrow grants, and it's hard for them to meet the needs outside of those funding sources. So of course, greater flexibility is needed, but also further collaboration with partners. Uh, we talked about uh, health systems and uh, uh, hospitals and community health centers, but as cities, um, they they need that nobody's going to solve these issues alone. They they need to work in collaboration with 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 partners. Uh, and as cities can better map their emergency response and crisis stabilization systems to ensure greater alignment and greatest use of available resources. So we see systems mapping as a key tool to support cities in these efforts. Partnerships, uh, regional response networks uh, are really needed to overcome individual community capacity constraints. Certainly in smaller to mid-sized cities, uh, there's significant capacity constraints. In times of great necessity, like those that we're in now, lots of cities and counties are standing up partnerships to meet needs. So opportunities exist to help these become more sustainable. Metrics, uh, city, states, and the federal government should work together to align program definitions. Uh, homelessness, uh, for example, is defined differently by different agencies, making it harder to harmonize, align efforts and initiatives to support vulnerable populations. So that's an area we see uh, for, for to make progress on as we move into the future. So these recommendations with many others are detailed in the summary. A link is provided to that through this forum. And uh, I'll end uh, with now with COVID, what are we seeing, right? Uh, data, uh, this was talked about earlier um, by Charlotte, she talked about data. It's hard for cities to target resources to those most in need on the brink. So data continues to be an area of further focus. Uh, certainly cities are pivoting right now, standing up approaches with partners ranging from legal aid to homelessness coalitions to offer assistance. For example, in Greensboro, their tenancy, uh, I'm sorry, tenancy preservation project in Newark, their Office of Tenant Legal Services, in San Antonio, Financial Recovery Centers. So these are the type of efforts that can further enhance work in this area that we're, that we're looking at. And certainly key partners through Cities Continuum of Care provide a suite of services for homelessness, uh, folks uh, experiencing homelessness. So nonprofit, uh, community-based organizations, homeless service organizations, churches, faith-based religious organizations and coalitions, community development organizations. We feel like these are the types of partnerships emerging that can also uh, be expanded in this area. So with that, uh, I'm gonna pause uh, and, and turn it back over to Katie. Actually, this is Meg Chapman. I'm gonna jump in. Before we lose um, folks, we really appreciate you all taking the time to participate. As you've seen in the chat session, we provided information on all of our participants and our moderator, as well as links to various resources that were referenced during the, the um, discussion, including the guidebook that was highlighted in the front end of the discussion. And within that uh, guidebook is a number of resources, both outcomes and, and logic modeling to support the um, evaluations and, and data collection that all of the panelists have have stressed would be of value to the field. So we thank you so much for your participation and um, please see the chat for additional resources and um, a uh, recording of this session will be sent out, pushed out to all of you um, within the day. Thank you again for your time.